Are you ready to take action to attain the lifestyle of your dreams? It's a great way to make a lot of money fast, fast, fast. Hey, what's going on, Clever Investor? Sperber here. Welcome back to the Clever Investor Show. And today, baby, we got one of my favorite human beings, a fantastic entrepreneur, somebody I look up to. I've been following on social for a long time. I've actually been lucky enough to go out to his headquarters for Fit Body Boot Camp and uh, actually be on your podcast twice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> once <laughs> once we deleted and I got it. He was gracious enough to give me a redo. The only time I ever went on a podcast and actually asked for a redo. Um, we got the great Bedros Kuyan in the studio here today. He's the founder of Fit Body Bootcamp, one of the fastest growing franchises in the world. If you don't know about Fit Body, just look around like the shopping centers. You're probably going to see one. Um, we're gonna we're gonna unpack how you you launch that company in the stratosphere, but you, you've done a lot of other things. You're you're a best selling author of the book Man Up. Uh, you have something called the project that I want to talk about, which is super epic, and Operation Black Site, and this really cool like giant uh, ranch that you turned into like one of the coolest facilities yeah. in the world for entrepreneurs and yeah, and athletes and actors and superstars and all that. So. Pedros, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me, Cody. Uh, pleasure to be in your headquarters and a beautiful place it is, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're, we love it. We love it. We're making money from it. We, we're create, It's a great creative space. And I get to hang out with cool people like you and talk about uh, how to excel in life and business and, and all the above. Um, so first off, dude, uh, you are like the uh, the poster child of like immigrant rags to riches to massive impact story. I mean, you've gone through a lot to get to where you are right now. Um, and uh, a lot of times people on these podcasts, they, they want you to tell your whole entire life story and it eats up all 50 minutes. You have a lot of content out there about you. So I don't necessarily want to like go all the way back in time and talk about everything, but in like a short version how did you get to a place where you are right now, where you're doing all these epic things and, and helping men and entrepreneurs break through? Uh, good good question, man. So the bottom line is my family and I immigrated from the Soviet Union when I was six years old, came to the United States. We lived in Section 8 housing, ate out of dumpsters, you know, food stamps, the whole thing. My dad had to decide whether we're paying the electric bill or the gas bill because we couldn't afford all the bills. Um, but all that said... I knew that I had one thing going for me, and that was the ability to be resourceful because I saw my parents having to become resourceful. One great story I can tell you is one of the, one of the crappy housing complexes we lived in, Santa Ana, California, gang-infested community, also lice-infested uh, this particular apartment that we had. And I get it, man. Like, you know, the government helps out and they put you in the best apartment complex they can, but this one had lice, right? So I got lice. My mom and dad, they couldn't afford lice treatment. And so my mom had my dad siphon out gasoline from a parked car and she washed my hair with gasoline. And I saw so many examples of being resourceful in the absence of resources. So as I grew up and, um, you know, decided that fitness was my path, I wanted to become a personal trainer. Unbeknownst to me, like now I think about it, I go, duh, it makes sense. But unbeknownst to me, when you're a personal trainer, especially working one-on-one with clients, the clients that can afford high-end one-on-one personal training, where it's like $600 to $1,200 a month to work with a personal trainer, not that I was getting that money. They were paying the gym. The gym was paying me $12.95 an hour, right? Mm. But dude, I had built-in mentors. My personal training clients were built-in mentors. So I had entrepreneurs. I had people that were running like big companies like C- uh, uh, Sony, Sony Pictures out, out, I was out here in California, but out there in California where I live. And so now I've got these built-in mentors and soon they start mentoring me. They start telling me that I can, they start speaking into me that I can open up my own gym, that I can be an entrepreneur, that I can make millions. I remember one particular mentor, uh, personal training client, he would drive up in a different car every day of the week. It was like this Cadillac Escalade, then this old classic Mercedes, and then this like hot rod sports car. And one day I asked him, his name is Jim Frank. I'm like, Jim, how many cars do you have? He goes, as many as I want. I go, I guess I just thought like we could only have one car. He's like, no, kid. And he always called me kid. He goes, no, kid, you could have as many as you want. And I was like 25, 24 at the time, right? And my, he just like blew my mind 
that you can have multiple cars. I go, well, how do you do it? He goes, I take a little bit of money from a lot of people. And that was the first real entrepreneurial lesson I got was to take a little bit of money from a lot of people. And then the mentorship, once I realized I've got built-in mentors, I would offer them an extra personal training session for free each week if they would then spend time with me afterwards to pour into me. But that led to having these mentors coach me that gave me confidence because if they say I can open up a gym, if they say I can be an entrepreneur, if they're bringing books and cassette tapes to me, teaching me how to sell, um, I was learning from Tom Hopkins, Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar books that they were given to me, right? And I would read it and give it back to them. I was like, man, if these people that make tons of money believe in me, there's no way I can let them down. And so while I had my poor dad and I love my dad to pieces, like he worked his nuts off. Like we escaped communism, bro. Like this guy risked his life, my dad, to bring us to the United States. But beyond that, his ambitions for me was to be a smog technician. He goes, I know you like cars, so go work in a mechanic shop, be a smog technician, right? And so, but then my rich dad, Jim Franco, my personal training client, I was like, dude, you can have as many cars as you want, as long as you help as many people as you can, and as long as you take a little bit of money from a lot of people. And if you look at all seven of my businesses, including Fit Body Bootcamp, that's what it's all based on. EFT, electronic fund transfer, where we extract money from bank accounts every month in exchange for value, whether it's Fit Body Bootcamp, you know, for their personal training services. And we have locations all throughout US and Canada, whether it's my coaching services, whether it's the software that I own, everything is built on all my businesses except for one. Um, is built on recurring revenue subscription. And I, if I could stack that, then I literally not only can have a huge exit on any one of my companies whenever I want, but I can also have predictable money. The first of the month, I don't have to start at zero. The first of the month for me starts at millions of dollars in revenue and I sleep better at night. I love that. Yeah, that, that, the first thing I did when I got into online education in 2009 was build a free plus shipping and handling offer that led to a continuity program. Yeah, 97 bucks a month. I still have it going today. We have, we have um, thousands of people that pay us 97 bucks a month. It is the greatest feeling in the world to create something one time and sell access to it over and over and over. And um, so I love hearing that. Uh, how, how, so you're a personal trainer and you come up with this idea for group, training sessions, yeah. which eventually became Fit yeah. Body Bootcamp. And a lot of entrepreneurs and investors listen to this show. And the show's all about making money, then making your money matter, or making money, then multiplying your money, then eventually making it matter, right? So there's people that have an idea all the time, but they don't know how to execute on it. So how did you, you're sitting at a gym, your personal training one-on-one, -on -one, you come up with this idea for this group business. How do you actually execute on it? What was that process? Was yeah. it, did you have to go through a mental pro thing? How did you raise the capital? How did you implement your first stores? Like walk through that beginning phase. So it's funny you say that, right? Because Jim Franco gave me the idea of, or gave me the belief system when, when I didn't have belief in me, my mentor believed in me. And so I didn't want to let him down that I could open up my own personal training studio. So the five personal training gyms that I had, they were called Premier Results, not, not Fit Body Bootcamp. They were called Premier Results in the early 2000s. Um, were all one-on-one -on -one personal training. I had about 10 to 12 personal trainers doing one-on-one -on -one personal training in there. So you started just doing your own version of what you were already doing. Exactly, right? Okay. Because I already knew what worked, except I was doing it at LA Fitness in the big box gym and I knew LA Fitness was keeping all the money. I go, well, what if I can keep the money and pay my trainers better than 12 bucks an hour, pay them 20 bucks an hour, right? Now they're going to be loyal. So I still did one-on-one -on -one personal training, but then 2008 happens, the big housing market crash. Yeah. My personal training business is suffering because now at that point, all these people who could afford one-on-one -on -one personal training, now more than 50% of them are like, hey man, my husband lost a job. We lost all this money in housing market. Sorry, I can't do one-on-one -on -one personal training with you. Well, if that's happening to me, that's happening with other gym owners all across the country. And I started to hear that. At this point, I had five gyms throughout San Diego. And each one was like 3,000 square feet. You know I mean, they're not mega gyms because it was only one-on-one -on -one personal training. You can't just be a member there and work out for 29 bucks. How much can you make from like one gym, 3,000 square foot? You got 10, 12 trainers filtering in and out. They got their own client base. They're kind of, I'm guessing they're renting. Do you get a piece of their clients or do they give you a flat no, fee? No, they're my employees. So they're not renting. Oh, That's got not it. The, it's not oh, the rent model. They're okay. my employees. I literally took the exact model from LA Fitness and parlayed it into How much a, can you make from just a gym? About $40,000 a month from a 3,000 square foot gym that's got about 10 trainers. And then that 40 grand, you're keeping about mm, 15, 16 of it as profit per gym. Per okay. gym. All yeah. right. So not bad, right? 
not bad. And you're paying at the time, you know, 2,500 a month to, to rent the space, to rent the space, basic equipment. Like I'm not filling up 20,000 square feet. I'm filling up 3,000 square feet. A lot of it is functional stuff, not machines you find in a gym. So the big expense to fill up a location, to the whole build up and build, uh, build out and build up was about 30 grand all in. So 30 grand all in, you've got a business that does, once you have full capacity of 10 trainers, about 40 grand a month, you're keeping 15, 16, 17 grand a month of that as profit. Each gym had two sales reps and 10 trainers. Okay. They sold and made commission. Trainers made hourly pay. Plus if they got the clients to re-sign after the six month term or 12 month term and everybody bought, just like Jim told me, don't sell blocks of sessions at a time like LA Fitness. That's the only thing that was different. LA Fitness was selling blocks of sessions at a time. Then I'd have to go and resell them. Jim said, Jim Franco said, sell them a six month or a 12 month membership. Let them pay continuity, right? He exposed me to that. And so now I had EFT, electronic fund transfer coming in. Five gyms, sucking out money from bank accounts, delivering value to clients all over San Diego. And so, but 2008 housing market crash happens and I'm realizing, holy shit. I can't afford these personal trainers anymore. I can't run one-on-one -on -one personal training. People need a program that's still personal training, but it has to be affordable and convenient. Those were the two things I kept hearing. I need it to be affordable and I need it to be convenient. I can't pay, afford to pay you guys six, 700 bucks. I heard that so many times throughout my five gyms. I was like, all right, convenient because remember, if you're working out with one-on-one -on -one personal trainer at 5 a.m., sorry, that 5 a.m. class is taken, right? Or 5 a.m. session is taken. Yeah. But in a class or group environment, Cody and 20 other people can work out at 5 a.m. So the convenience factor was that can I make a group training program and put 20, 25, 30 people in at one time? Yes, I can. Can one trainer run that class? Yes, they can. And how I sold myself on that was if NFL level coaches are running, are coaching these high level athletes that are going to go into the Super Bowl or NBA, whatever the sport is. If they can take pro athletes in a group environment and train them, coach them, make them better, couldn't I take the average Mrs. Jones who has 30, 40 pounds to lose, who needs to become more, more active and help her burn fat? Absolutely. So we focused on their diet on a one-on-one -on -one still, but the training happened fast paced, 30 minute sessions, 15 minute break in between next class, 30 minute sessions, 15 minute break next class. So we had about six classes in the morning, three at night after work. And all of a sudden, personal training was in a group environment and we were charging $169 a month. And so it's of, affordable, it's convenient. Bro. Now, are you running it under that same business or did you come up with the name Fit Body Bootcamp and you already lateraled over? Later, that became Fit Body Bootcamp. So after okay. 2008, I said, well, if my gyms can do that, all these other one-on-one -on -one personal training gyms need to convert. So I told them, here's what you need to do to make money right now. You don't have one-on-one -on -one clients, 90% of them left. You guys need to sell as many pieces of equipment as you can to open up floor space. You're going to run group training and I'm going to license out the Fit Body Bootcamp model. So 2009, 10, and 11, Fit Body Bootcamp was a licensing model. Mm. Here's where things go crazy. As entrepreneurs, what do we do? We take risks and we kind of venture into the unknown uh, without, with just this positive attitude of like, it, it'll work out. It'll work out. And so I figured I'm going to license out the whole group training program. 30 minute sessions, 15 minute breaks. We created what we call the four station rotation. So there's four stations, TRX bands, let's say, battle ropes, step up um, boxes, and then kettlebells. So now we got, you know, 20 clients in there rotating in 30 minutes. Boom, you're out. Next group come in 15 minutes later. All that's great. So we're teaching that, licensing that out. But what I didn't want to do was what CrossFit had. I didn't want to create a adversarial relationship between fit body locations. So I figured I'll give them an eight mile protected territory. By doing that one thing, a licensing program just entered the franchising waters. Oh, and I didn't I know that. Okay. Right? Because now when you give a, this is why CrossFit does not have protected territories. You could open up a CrossFit here and I can open one across the street and we're going to have to duke it out and survival of the fittest. I didn't want that. I wanted all fit body owners to play nice, get together, right? Enjoy each other. So protect the territory. So the great state of California comes to me and goes, hey, You've got 80 some odd fit body locations. You're giving them all protected territories. We're finding you $2,500 per location. I'm like, I can't afford that. And these people have now signed a lease. They've sold equipment. They've put in the flooring that I've asked them to do. 
like I'm coaching them. If you tr- find me this $2,500 per location, I'm just going to file bankruptcy and leave. No one's going to be able to coach these gym owners and they're going to fail. And for once, the state of California showed grace and they said, I'll tell you what, don't sell another licensed location, turn into a franchise and we'll waive your $2,500 per location fee. So that's wow, exactly that's what- That's interesting. Yeah. They actually yeah, yeah. like- had some common sense and some business savvy yeah. and said, this, Way is, back then. this is our goal, what yeah. we want you to do. Well, and, and they wanted that because did somebody, did somebody complain? How did they, how did, I wonder how they got I don't it. It's almost like they, a competitor was like, yeah. screw these guys. Let's, let's Listen, turn them in. Right at that time, because I was the first guy to take group training, like kind of national. Up until then, you saw boot camps happening in parks and parking lots and, you know, gym or uh, uh, at the beaches, but you never saw an outdoor uh a boot camp that Very had structured equipment. Indoors. Yeah, right. That had a system and a process to it. My brain's always systematized, process driven. So that's what I did. And yeah, there were some competitors popping up throughout Southern California. And I imagine it just took one call to the to the to the tax board or someone. And very quickly the state of California was like gonna slap me. But again, resourcefulness. I was like, what can we do to keep me in business so I can keep coaching these 80 locations? And can I pay the fine over time? Can I not sell in? I, I was the one throwing them the options. Can I pay the fine over time? Can I pay a discounted fine? Can I, can I not sell any more locations until I become a franchise and therefore you can waive the fine? They went back, thought about it. They go, fuck it. We'll let you do that. Cool. Took me yeah. 11 months to become a franchise. So when you're going through that, are, for step one, go find what? A franchise attorney? Yep. A franchise expert? Yeah. Are you hiring consultants to help you w- figure this out? Because- that's a big step, right? Yeah, you got it. There's is. a lot of moves yeah. in. So I, I, I did a little research and I realized that I need a franchise attorney, number one, and I need an SOP, standard operating procedure manual, right? Like everything. Apparently from what I understood back then, you want to go put the key in the door, unlock the door, turn on the lights, put the equipment out. Like everything has to be systematized in the franchising world. Once you go from licensing to franchising, you just have to assume that the education level and the understanding level is, is at a, that of a minor, uh, and, and this is not an insult on franchisees. The Federal Trade Commission, because once you become a franchise, you're now governed by the Federal Trade Commission. And so whether you're Subway, Jiffy Lube, 7-Eleven, or Fit Body Bootcamp, you have an FDD, a franchise disclosure document, an FA franchise agreement. You have to have an SOP manual that has to be updated all the time and has to have the granular details of everything. Because if there's a detail missing and Coda becomes a fit body owner and says, I failed because they didn't tell me that the battle ropes needed to be curled up at the end of the workouts and somebody tripped over it and I got sued, then you can bring that lawsuit over to me as well, right? And so there are those complexities. So franchising isn't sexy, but those that are willing to learn about it and stick their neck out and go into franchising prepared, it is very profitable, both in the business and when you exit. Franchises typically sell for three, four, sometimes five X a typical business because it's a more predictable, desirable model for a private equity to buy, right? And and how much more likely is a franchisee to succeed because they're buying into a proven model? Is this like- Eight times. Okay. That's the crazy thing, right? And we all know the stats. Like, what is it? Something like the first- in the first year, 80% of businesses fail. And then the next, like in the next five years, another 80% of those fail, blah, blah, blah. Well, where franchising is concerned, the success rate is 8x higher. Because again, you've got a working model. You've got the Federal Trade Commission telling you every year, by the way, we go through three audits a year. Three audits of the year through Moss Adams, which is a certified bona fide uh, uh, auditing company by the Federal Trade Commission. And so every year we have to show our books and there's 13 states separate states that say whether you can or can't sell franchises that year based on how many locations have closed, not just in that state, but nationally, right? So and your so, failure rate is tracked. And if it mm-hmm. crosses a threshold, they, they what? Pull, yeah. pull back on what you can and yeah. cannot do? Yeah. The term is you go dark for a year in that state. And, and Hawaii is different than California. And Illinois has a different threshold than those two states. There's 13 states. So there's like, you know, the 47 plus mm-hmm. 13. Um, well, no, not 47. Was that 37 plus 13? My math was off. 37 states uh, follow fall under one FDD, and then the other 13 states have their own FDD franchise disclosure document, which is great because again, the barrier to entry to becoming a franchisor is high. So if someone's a franchisor, like they got to have their poop in a group, 
And so what works, right? And by the way, you have to, you have to disclose any locations that shut down. You have to disclose for three years in a certain section of your FDD. So imagine how hard we work to not only have everything systematized, but bring on the right franchisees that have the work ethic, that have the focus, that have the resourcefulness, that have the emotional discipline. But also, if they are going through a rough patch in their life, they're, let's say they're going through a divorce, they're going through some financial hardship, you're coaching them as the franchisor. We have a team, a compliance team, compliance officer, Brittany has a team of compliance members, uh, support reps, that are literally life coaching our franchisees because that divorce might lead to a failed location. And then we have to disclose it in our FDD. Now, Cody wants to buy six locations out here in Arizona. He looks in the back of the FDD. Whoa, hey, uh, that guy that had eight locations closed down. And here's his number. Let me just call him. That guy's not going to say it was because of my divorce or because of my gambling habits. He's going to say, well, I didn't get the support I needed from headquarters, right? So we make sure, and all franchises need to make sure, that they are literally coaching, supporting their Zs. So we're the Zor, they're the Zs, just so you understand, that they are coaching and supporting their Zs at the most granular level to succeed. And this is why you look at F45 right now, they're on a massive downslide. Uh, the CEO is on the run. Uh, his house got foreclosed. They cut 50%. F45 lost 50% of their team at, her, at their headquarters. They had to do a massive cut because they stopped bringing on new locations. So now think about the existing locations who need support. They probably have the worst employees to lean on because the best employees who were paid the highest. Now, was F45 the one Mark Wahlberg was yes, involved in? Yes, wow. exactly. So if you grow too quick as a franchise and you can't keep up with the support or you just bring on any kind of franchisee that will give you the buy-in fee and your franchise royalties, but they don't have the same core values, soon it begins to collapse on each other. So you got F45 in the, sandwich, in, in the fitness world. In the sandwich world, you've got um, Witch Witch and Quiznos. In the ice cream world, you've got Cold Stone Creamery. So every month I'm studying two franchises that succeed. Every month I'm studying two franchises that failed. Why did these guys succeed? Why did they fail? So is Witch Witch suffering right now? Which, which is now gone. So is um, Quiznos. They're gone. Gone. And Quiznos had a better sandwich than Subway, didn't they? I loved Quiznos, but- Same. Yeah. Toasted, better product. Yep. They didn't have yoga yoga mat material in their fucking bread. Remember that yep. when, when the uh, food <laughs> babe, the food babe on her blog, like found like there was like one and a half percent like yoga mat material yeah, in the bread disgusting. at Subway because it kept the bread more fluffy. But all this to say, sometimes it's not the superior product that wins. It's the one that has a superior franchise support. Wow. Okay. So how are you building your team around you as you're scaling this thing? Are you just on like a constant hiring spree? Are you thinking about it? Like, I'm going to go, like, let's say you can only afford X amount for a CFO or X amount for an operations office. Are you stretching? Are you raising capital? Like, how are you thinking about scaling this thing? Because obviously yeah. the model's working. You're making money. Are you just like, screw it. I'm just dumping all my money back into scaling this team. Yeah. 100, I've yet, other than a, a, a $5,000 a month uh, salary that I get from Fitbody, I take nothing else out, which is why I have all my other companies. Wait, what, you, you make a $5,000 salary? Yeah, a month. Well, <laughs> during the pandemic, I even brought that down to zero, right? Wow. Yeah, but then in 2022, my salary restarted at five grand, but I've never taken out, out any distributions, nothing. We just keep reinvesting the money and that's how we're, we're either recruiting or we're building developing from within. And in the franchising world, there's an 18 month leadway. So if you brought on a whole bunch of franchisees, 18 months from now, you're going to feel the pain from that. So you have to be 18 months ahead. So we're always planning. Like right now we're looking to go into Saudi Arabia. We have to build a team that can support Saudi Arabia about 12 to 18 months ahead of time, because that's just how franchising works. The way I liken it to is a uh, cruise ship. A cruise ship, let's say, goes, uh-oh, we're going the wrong direction. That's not Puerto Rico. We need to make a U-turn. A cruise ship is going to go one degree at a time over many, many miles, over many, many hours to go the other direction. A speedboat, like our coaching business, our educational mm -hmm. business, you can just whip it right around, right? And so where franchising is concerned, we're recruiting. Uh, LinkedIn gets, very, gets used a lot from us. So we'll reach out to a, for example, we reached out to a very popular pizza franchise chain. and. Um, we said, hey, uh, well, not to the chain, but we reached out to the compliance officer of that chain. And we said, hey, looks like you're doing a great job with compliance officing for this pizza chain franchise. 
How would you like to do the same thing at Fit Body Bootcamp where you're selling fitness and not fatness? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Right? And, and, and you're Come also- Come to the, 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 the light side, right. the dark side. Exactly. And you're, we're also going to give you some stock options. And she came right on over, right? Which is interesting that, I mean, the best talent is already employed. So you really yeah. got to go on like a yeah. relationship building recruiting spree. Are you guys constantly doing that? Like constantly. you ever shut the hiring machine off? Well, only during 2020 is when we shut, during the pandemic is when we shut the hiring machine off. And that was the only time we gave our team a 20% pay cut, which I went down to $0 from Fit Body Bootcamp. Um, and I told them that I would, that we weren't going to fire a single person and we didn't fire a single person. And on top of that, I made up their money in 2022. Wow. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that because the world shut down. You're in a, a close quarter, high impact. People are breathing heavy. They're, they're working out. Touching the same equipment. They're touching the same yeah. equipment. And all of a sudden the world's about to shut down because of this, this pandemic. Um, how bad did it hurt you guys? And what did you guys do to pivot? Well, I think now as we look back, historically, you know that restaurants and gyms felt it the worst, right? And so- How as, many locations did you have up to that point? Uh, we had 640 locations up to that point. And, and you're just living life. You're thinking you're yeah. untouchable. You're you're gunning, probably yeah. going to sell this thing at some point. Yeah, exactly. Like We're going to have a big exit. Real good. You know, I'm, I'm thinking like, I remember telling my wife, Cody, I was like, you know, I wonder what a hundred million dollar or 150 or $200 million check looks like. I don't mm. want a wire transfer. I want that as a check. I want to see the zeros, right? Just and, holding it, yeah, just yeah, knowing. Yeah. Like, and she's like, you you're dumb. It. I'm like, well, dumb or not, I want that check. And they could still do the wire transfer, but I want that, right? Like that's where we were headed. But March 16th, 2020, I had to announce to all Fit Body owners um, via live, live Zoom, the guys we need to shut down for two weeks, flatten the curve. This is a death virus. Everything we had heard at the time was COVID was it. It was like very contagious and very bad for survivability. But coming from a communist country, I also realized never trust the government. And so I told Bryce, who was my, v, who was my VP at the time, now he's the CEO of Fit Body Bootcamp. I was like, Brycey, we're going to shut down for two weeks, but I want you to prepare as though we're going to be shut down for a year. And in case we have to move all of our location locations to Zoom-based Facebook group, live workout coaching, create at least 30 days of workouts in case we need a pivot. So now week three comes. No locations are allowed to open. Week four comes. At this point, now Fox News has me on their show like almost once a week because I'm just actively on social media talking out against the government by week four of the pandemic. Like, hey, when is the shutdown going to be over? Why can't we go to beaches? Why can't we go outdoors? Why can't, because now they were like, you, anything you that was good anything. for you, yeah, yeah, anything that was actually good for your immune system, you can't see sunlight, you can't be around people, yet you can go into Walmart and lick doorknobs, that's okay, but you can't go into a gym and get a workout in where your immune system is actually going to improve, where your, where your body's chemicals are actually going to improve uh, in a way that your immune system is going to get stronger. And so I saw that there's something going on here that's greater than, there's like an agenda here. And so we pivoted to online coaching, and I told all my franchisees, don't ask me to stop your franchise royalties because we're going to be here to support you. And I want you guys to go and message to your clients that just because you can't come work out at a Fit Body Bootcamp, you can still work out with us online. We're going to continue to do this. We're going to continue the Fit Body Strong way. That's one of our hashtags, Fit Body Strong. We're going to continue it Got online. It doesn't matter the adversity. We're going right. to pivot yeah. all as a yeah. whole entire group. Exactly. Reshift your focus. Bingo. Let's go, baby. Yeah. I want your clients to pay you and I want you to continue to pay me. And those of you that are in Texas and Florida that can open up, put butcher paper on your windows and start training people in person. The rest of you and all the other states like California that can't open up or that are getting fined, we're pivoting all online, right? So now remember, as a franchisee, I'm having to tell my Canadian locations one thing and then all my US locations in different states, a different message based on how, whether your state is blue or red, right? Like again, they're looking up to the franchisor saying, what do I do, man? I pay you a royalty every month. Now tell me what to do. Yeah. And so your our attorneys and our compliance team is like checking out laws and regulations. God, you're and, just walking a tightrope right now. Dude, right? And so- It I'm sounds on, good in yeah. theory. Hey, we're, we're going to keep the thing going, but the reality is- Yeah. Like you're opening yourself up to litigation, right? And most of these franchisees, they're- th Maybe this is their first shot at being an entrepreneur Correct. and they're, they're really struggling right yeah. now. They don't have a safety net. They're, no, they're small business owners, yep. right? They're small business owners. So how long before the closures or the, the, yeah, so those kind of things started happening? We all in all in 20, all throughout 2020, we lost 218 franchise locations, right? Which was like, you could imagine your whole identity since 2000. That's a third. That's a third. 
A third. Yeah. My whole identity since 2009, 2010 was tied to Fit Body Bootcamp. That's what put me on the map. That's what got us on the Inc. 500, Inc. 5000, Entrepreneur Magazines, uh, 200 fastest growing franchises back in 2014 and 15. Your whole identity is tied to this thing. And now you're seeing literally every day, you're getting dozens of calls and emails to HQ saying, I got to shut down. That started right around, I would say, late May. Late May. By early so, June. Only a couple months. Mm -hmm. I mean, it only took them three, three yeah. months, yeah. four months. If, if their landlord isn't stopping their, their rent, and if you know clients are now putting their accounts on a freeze, they're like, I don't want to work out online. So some of the clients are putting their accounts yeah. on a freeze. So their, their, their royalty, their EFT, electronic fund transfer, is shrinking for our franchisees. Like, I get it. And we were giving them some... So now, not only are we losing locations, but the ones that say they can stay afloat, if we cut back on their royalty fees, we would just say, all right, how about we don't charge you royalties for three months, four months, five months, right? I just want you to stay open. Because remember, every location that shuts down... You have to disclose. I have to and, disclose. And, and, and you're probably not making new sales. Dude, we average about seven sales a month on a, on, on when, in a non-pandemic year, building up to the pandemic. We were averaging seven sales a month. So many of our listeners reach out and they ask us how they can get involved in my actual real estate deals. Our investment firm specializes in finding deeply discounted properties, acquiring them, renovating, stabilizing both single family and multifamily properties all over the United States. That's why we're so excited to share with you clevercapitalfund.com. Now, if you have some investment capital and you want to deploy it and receive double digit returns back by real estate, then visit our website and see which fund is right for you. We have both equity funds and we have debt funds where you just get paid out every month like clockwork. All you got to do is visit www.clevercapitalfund.com today to learn more. All of 2020, we got six sales total. And all six of them, when our, when our sales rep would go, dude, we closed another deal. I'm like, who the hell <laughs> is buying a franchise right now, right? That but person I, gets a poster yeah. up in HQ. Yeah, like, yeah, like <laughs> you should have six posters up there. You know, you, that, that, so not only those are people we, have to succeed. Dude, not only are we not selling new locations, all in all, we lost 218 and you're seeing your identity collapse around you, right? And it's a, it's a very hurtful, painful thing. And, and you realize these are small business owners. Like as they're shutting down, they have to go bankrupt. They have to tell their landlord, I can't continue on with my lease. They might be leasing some of the equipment that they got to then, you know, walk away from. Like it was really sad to see good people across America and Canada having to walk away, man. It just crushed Especially my heart. Especially looking back now at yeah. just the BS yeah. and it all. Just the absurdity. Now that we know what really took yeah. place. Oh, God, it pisses me off. Yeah. Now, at, before this happened, you started something called The Project. Yeah. Okay, The Project. Explain what The Project is. And up until that time, you have done one, two, three, four, five of those projects mm -hmm. leading into this. So you mentioned that you're, you don't really take money from Fitbody, you're reinvesting it, but you're making money in other ways. Yeah. Project is one of the other ways you do it. So what is The Project and... Where were you at with that up until the pandemic? Yeah. So, so kind of like you and I were having the conversation um, at lunch earlier, you know, um, like most high-speed entrepreneurs who are male, um, I come from trauma. I was molested as a kid growing up in Armenia by two older boys. I compartmentalized that and put it away, never thought about it. Uh, then, you know, you come to the United States, you don't speak English, you don't understand the culture, you're, you're in gang-infested communities, gangbangers are stealing your shit, beating you up, and you just cope with it the best you can, but you got all types of trauma there. Uh, but again, compartmentalize, be resourceful, move on, right? That's, that's kind of what we do. But sooner or later that catches up and I'm 48 years old now, but at the age of 37, Cody, uh, I wrote, you know, uh, in my book, Man Up, I call it the chapter is titled the morning of my heart attack, because at the age of 37, I had this panic attack, the first of many to come that was so bad, bro. Like I thought I was having a heart attack. I'd never had a panic attack before. I felt stress. I felt anxious before, but I've never had a anxiety attack or a panic attack. And both arms start tingling. My throat shuts, like closes, felt like I can't breathe anymore. I'm getting tunnel vision. I can hear my heartbeat, thug, lug, thug, lug, thug, lug in my ear, like super loud, sweating profusely, man. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on with me right now? It's a Monday morning, right? And I got to go to work. I got to fucking make shit happen. And in that moment, I go, this, this has to be a heart attack. It can't be anything else. I'm having a heart attack. This is how I go. And I accepted death very quickly. But I felt so much sadness for two people. Chloe, my daughter, at the time was seven. And I was thinking, who's going to walk Chloe down the aisle? And then Andrew, my son, 
who was nine. And I remember thinking, who's going to teach him to be a modern day knight? And I just felt so sad for them. Like, I didn't know who that guy was going to be to raise them and how it was going to go. But I accepted death very quickly, which I still ponder. Like, why did I accept death so quickly? Whatever the case was, uh, I was up in my guest house because I left my shoes up in the guest house the night before. I play the drums. I play the drums barefoot. My guest, my guest house is above my garage. So I went and got my shoes. And um, I'm, so now I'm like, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die on the pool deck so my wife can find me so that she doesn't find me like 12 hours later, all bloated and rigor mortis, right? That's going to be like traumatic for her. So I stumble down the staircase. I'm walking across the pool deck thinking any minute now I'm going to go. And for some, I don't know if it's the fresh air, if it was the movement, but all of a sudden all these feelings just wash away. I'm just left in a sweaty puddle. I'm like, well, fuck it, man. You got work to do. Go jump in the car and leave. So long story short, that led to me going to the doctor the next day, figuring out, telling him, hey, I think I had a heart attack. They checked my heart. Everything's fine. Bedros, nothing's wrong with you. How's your stress level? I'm like, man, I'm fucked up. He's like, well, what you had is a panic attack and there's going to be more unless you do something about it. So they put me on Xanax, four days on Xanax. I feel like I've got no creativity, no desire to work, no agency. I'm like, I can't they do did, this. They, ca- they mentally, or uh, yeah, like they uh, chemically castrated you yeah. almost. Like yeah. you're just like, Meh. yeah. Like, I don't know what a loser, loser feels like because I'm not a loser, but for four days, I felt like a fucking loser just sitting on a couch. Like, I, yeah, I did. I wasn't stressed. I wasn't anxious, but I had no excitement for life. So I called the doctor. I'm like, this won't work. I'm not taking Xanax. What's next? He goes, how about talk therapy, right? So I'm like, all right, talk therapy. Well, that's for broken people. I'm fine. He goes, no, a therapist can teach you like tools that'll help you cope with your anxiety. Isn't that funny how that's how we think? Right, we're so fucked up. It's so stupid. Especially now, once you go through it and you really really do have a lot of breakthroughs because your subconscious remembers everything. 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 We're so good at compartmentalizing it and putting it away and putting a box in front of it and another box on top of it. So you can't even see the fucking box, but it's there and it carries a weight and that weight shows. And so long, short, long and short of it, I, I find this therapist named Kevin Downing. He's in his sixties. Looks like Einstein with no eyebrows. That's the only way I could describe <laughs> him, right? Just like white hair sticking all everywhere, but no eyebrows. And Kevin gives me these tools over four weeks. Action alleviates anxiety. Anxiety is anticipation of future pain. Avoid halting. Halt stands for hungry, angry, lonely, tired. When you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, you're going to more likely go into an anxiety attack. The alcoholic is more likely to go back to the bottle. The gambling addict is more likely to go gamble. So control your halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Uh, So in four weeks, I got those tools and yeah, okay, my anxiety got substantially better, right? Because I addressed what I needed to address. I stopped anticipating you know, weird shit that wasn't ever going to happen. because All the what man, ifs of the future. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, on week four, I'm like, Kevin, thank you so much. High five. Here's my last credit card statement uh, receipt. I'm fixed. I'm fixed. <laughs> this worked, right? Especially again, being type A. I, Yo, I, don't you wish it was that easy? Bro, bro. Now, I got to draw this picture. He's on the second floor, right? Of this weird little building that looks like it's from the 70s in Brea, California. He's on the second floor. Out of the window, I could, whenever I'm sitting on his couch and he's sitting in front of me, we're doing the therapy, I could see my, my, my truck. Now I'm, a, I'm, I'm at his door of his little office and I'm giving him the receipt. See you later. Nice meeting you. And uh, he goes, hey, before you leave, is there anything else you want to talk about? I was like, nope, you fixed me. I'm good to go. He goes, what about your childhood? I'm, what about it? He goes, well, how about your parents? Everyone's parents did something to fuck them up, right? I'm like, listen, man, my dad's a former communist. You know, he was heavy handed. He gave me beatings, whatever. I get it, man. That's, I, I've forgiven him. I go, plus what happened to me in Armenia was way worse than what the beatings of my dad gave me. In four weeks, Kevin Downing built such rapport with me that I was able to you throw that it. little nugget out. I never shared it with my wife, never shared it with anyone, right? Wow. I carried the weight of being molested by two older boys. I carry the weight of, of what happened to me as a kid here in America, growing up in Section 8 housing, and just sucked it all in and minded my own business, head down, horns out, and plowed forward. And there at 38, I, Kevin goes, what happened? And I just start bawling. I'm crying. Now, I'm standing at, the, at his doorway. All I want to do is I want to fling myself out his window because I feel that's the fastest way to get to my truck. But my legs are like cement. I can't go towards the staircase. I can't fling myself to the glass. He's sitting there and he's looking at me like, like he wants to hold me. And Cody, 
He goes, can you tell me what happened? And I just, now it's like snot coming out, bro. I'm like holding on to the fucking door up. jam. Yeah. And I'm like, it, the, my inner voice is like, what the fuck is going on with you right now? Leave, go that way or fling yourself, but leave. I got cement for fucking legs, bro. I'm not going anywhere, right? So Kev, I, I can't talk. Words aren't coming out. Kevin goes, uh, were you abused? And I just nod my head yes as I'm crying. He goes, uh, by a babysitter? Uh, no. By a female? No. By a male? Yes. And then I, he goes, were you raped? No. Were you molested? Nodded my head yes. And then when I, the words that popped out was by two older boys right after that, right? He goes, oh, Bedros, I'm so sorry. I go, Kevin, don't be sorry for me. Uh, what happened to that little boy I've dealt with? He goes, can you say what happened to me? I'm healed. And I fucking start bawling again, mm, right? You're going to make me cry right now. Bro. Holy shit. I'm 38 years old. I went there for four sessions. He told me in four sessions, he'll give me tools to deal with my anxiety. And he built such rapport with me that I just felt like it, it came out, right? And I'm like, what the fuck is happening? Like this secondary conversation in my head I'm yelling at myself, like, just leave, stop talking. Don't give him anything else. But I can't, I feel compelled to, like I trust the man. I felt safe with the man. For once in my life, I felt safe being around another male figure. It was Kevin Downing and we're still friends today. And I've, I've referred 67 other men to him since from the project. I'll bring this around to the project in a second. So we spent the next 15 months, every Monday, working together, taking that giant fucking mountain in my life, of being molested, feeling unlovable, feeling broken, feeling unworthy. And he not, put- Not safe. Not safe. Yeah. Every man was adversity to me. So imagine a business partner who's also an, my, my adversary. How are we going to be great business partners if you're also a threat to me, right? That's how I entered every business partnership. Fucked up. No reason why all my business partnerships, pre 38 years old, were all fucked up. And so all that to say that as, as I healed- and as he helped put words to the three things that I felt, shame, rage, confusion. Shame, I'm so embarrassed this happened to me. No one can find out. If they do, they'll think I'm gross. Yeah, broken. Broken. Yeah. Rage, how the fuck did this happen to me? There wasn't anyone there to protect me as these two older boys over and over and over again molested me. And then confusion, am I gay? It's so, like, did I do something to make them do this to me? Right. So my whole life, that's like been the underlying voice, shame, rage, confusion, shame, rage, confusion. And Kevin put words to it. Now, as he says, he goes, dude, that, that mountain is just a little speed bump on your timeline of life. No different than the time you popped your bicep. No different than the time that you crashed your car. You know, it's just a little blip on your timeline. Something that happened. Healing is so magical. What I didn't know was when I told Kevin that what happened to that little boy I've dealt with, he told me that that's called disassociation. I'm disassociating from that child, my inner child. And basically, disassociation is the first step into creating multiple personality disorder. So that fucked me up. And that's what got me on his couch for the next 15 months. Because the last thing I wanted to have was some psychological disorder of multiple personalities or whatever. It freaked me out. So fast forward, 2019, several years later, I, uh, sorry, 2018, my book comes out, Man Up. Because now I've healed, became a better leader. Fit Body's on this massive trajectory. Coaching business is blowing up. I have ec uh, equity in several other companies that I've taken equity in. And I wrote this book, Man Up, that, you know, like, I would, literally, I manned up to my higher potential. I humaned up to my higher potential. And I, and then I talk about these six pillars of high performance. Uh, one of them is obviously healing and becoming your higher self. Long story short, in it, I talk about how I do these six-week challenges. Jiu-jitsu for six weeks train for a marathon and run a marathon in six weeks, mountain climbing, whatever. Things that scared me. I hired a coach for six weeks, went all in on it and did it and ended up just really expanding my capacity as a, as a human, not just in that one sport or salsa dancing, or all the weird shit that I've done, but also in the way I can give and accept love in my money, in my friendships, in my communication, because how you do anything is how you do everything, right? And so you, when, you, when you accomplish something awesome in this one area, it bleeds into every area of your life. Same as when you are out of congruency in one area, it bleeds into every area. So I talk about these challenges. I talk about healing in my book, Man Up. And when the book goes on sale, September, September 18, 2018, 
and, and all of our friends from Andy to Ed and all of them were kind enough to blow it up and Tom Billu and promote the Great shit book, out of it. Great book, by yeah, the way. Great you. book. Thank Re- you. Read it multiple Thank times. You. It's a fantastic Thank book. You. But because I talk about these challenges and, and, and working with the therapist, lo and behold, all these men are reaching out to me and they're going, hey, you should have some kind of a challenge for us that we can do that, you know, could be really tough and could be overwhelming and we could journal, da, da, da. I'm like, bro, I talk about it in my book. Just go pick a challenge, marathon, rock climbing, jujitsu, surfing, guitar lessons, go do it, right? But you know how it is. When they keep coming to you, you're like, I'm probably called to do this. So I reach out to a friend of mine, Ray. I'm like, hey man, you're a Navy SEAL. You work for the CIA now. Are you done working for the CIA? He goes, I am, if you can pay me 13 grand a month. I'm like, done, quit your job with the CIA, right? Call my friend who's a coaching client of mine, Steve Eckhart, he's a Marine, angry at the world, angry at the world, but one of the most fucking solid human beings on the planet. Like, hey man, I'm going to need you for this thing called the project. Can you do it? He goes, done. Another friend of mine, jujitsu. I need you to teach MMA hand-to-hand combat to men. Done. Another guy who's a sniper uh, for a SWAT team. Hey, I need you to teach pistol, like teach these guys how to be protectors with pistols and rifles, right? So now we've got a, a Marine and a Navy SEAL that are going to take them through a hell week type experience. And then I'm the fifth instructor. I'm going to take them through journaling, through business development, because I know that it's going to be high-speed entrepreneurs who want to go through tough stuff together for 75 hours straight. They can quit anytime they want by ringing a bell, just like the, uh, just like the SEALs uh, do in, in buds. And that was Ray's idea, the, the SEAL. He goes, hey, we need a bell. I go, why do we need a bell? These guys pay 12 grand to go through 75 hours as a group. They're going to go through this and they're going to want coaching from me and they want to learn all this cool shit from you guys. He goes, me and Steve are going to give them hell. I go, they paid 12 grand. No one's quitting. He goes, trust me, they're going to quit. Class one, we had two quitters. Class two, we had nine. You know, so since, since then, the average quit rate is about 25% of the men that start the 75 hour journey and 75 hours straight, um, about, about 25 to 30% quit. Ring the bell. So if I ring the bell, let's say I ring the bell, do I get to come back to a future one and try and for like, another twelve thousand dollars back you together should, for twelve thousand? Oh, I got to pay again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but, this is this is hardcore. Yeah, yeah. but if you were medically rolled, uh, we had a dude, dude tear a, uh, a calf. Uh, oftentimes, dudes will have rhabdo. Rhabdo is when you break down so much muscle in such a short amount of time that your kidneys can't process all that protein. Okay, and you end up pissing what looks like Coca Cola, like brown piss. That's your body going into rhabdo. Your legs and arms start cramping up and we have to have the medics ship you off to- Okay, so if it's a medical tap they out- They can come back. Yeah, right? It's not their fault. We have medics on hand. Now, when I te- ring the bell, are you like, see you later? You're out? We, right? have, a, we have a process for that because we, we know what we also unhinge men because we talk about, and people always go, well, why can't women do this? It's like, listen, it's a men's society because I put these men together. The whole project is really supposed to be four hours. And the evolution- because every evolution has a name, but the evolution that's four hours long happens at hour number 38 to 42. And it's called toxic cognitions. And it's a journaling exercise that Kevin, my therapist and I built out together, where it starts off with the most traumatic thing that ever happened in my life is, so I write mine and I read it out loud. I was molested by two older boys between the ages of four and six over and over again while in Armenia, right? And they're like, oh, fuck. And then they have to write what happened to them in, in their own journal. And then how did it make me feel? So I I read mine. Then they have to write theirs. And then how did it show up in my life? Right? So there's this whole process. And then at the end of the four hours, because this is, there's a lot of tears. It's the only evolution of the project where we have Kleenex boxes. Everything else, whether it's a truck pull or ice bath, or we take them to the beach and Ray tortures them in the ocean, or they're crawling the pit 400 yards uh, in the dark, cold uh, mud. Um, None of it has a Kleenex other than this evolution that I run. Uh, Because grown men fall apart. But we need them to become brothers. This is why it happens at hour number 38. Because strange men, type A, like us, build a wall. Like, I'm fine. I hope you're good. But every evolution is designed where we got to work together to get through these evolutions. So now strange men, by hour number 10, 11, 12, are calling each other brothers. Bro, I got you. We're doing this together. You can't carry that log. Let me take more, more of the weight. You can't keep your backpack on. I got it. I'll carry it for the next mile, right? We want this bonding to happen because we know at hour number 38, they're about to go vulnerable. And so they do. And that is really the core of the project. For the first time ever, these men talk about the traumas that have taken place in their life. And these traumas come in every flavor. And I've learned to purge them out of my system, uh, same as the other instructors have. Because if you don't, we end up carrying a lot of this weight because we have to hear it, we have to counsel them, and then we have to re- refer them to the right type of experts to work with them. 
Um, but I don't want to talk about it here because I would never break the trust of these men. But at class number five, which took place June of 2020. Right, when all this other stuff yeah. in your fit body world is breaking down. Right. By this point, I've lost 25, 26 fit body bootcamp locations. We're getting more owners calling us, telling us that if this continues on for another month or two, they're going to have to shut down. All I'm seeing is this big brand that I've built is just going to evaporate, right? 15 years of hard work is going to evaporate. And I'm having a hard time coping with that. I started drinking heavily again. And I'm not a heavy drinker at all. I'm a very occasional social drinker. Now I don't drink at all. This past November 12th, I gave up drinking altogether, drinking and weed. I just felt called to, but that's a different story. But at that time, I was drinking three, four cocktails a night. Um, Project Class 5, Cody, took place June 21st or 22nd. Starts, you know, it goes four days straight, 75 hours. Right around June 15th, I remember feeling defeated because we're losing so many fit body locations. Hearing from all these different attorneys that if I keep encouraging my fit body franchisees to put butcher paper on their windows and keep training their clients that I'm going to deal with bigger lawsuits because their fines are going to transfer to me because they can technically sue me for giving them advice as the franchisor. Going on Fox News four times in a, in a 60 day period, talking out against the government and actively telling my franchisees on Fox News, be out there training your clients, sanitize your equipment, but be out there training your clients, doing good. You know what's right for them. We're under attack. The opposition, which is big government that is funded by big pharma, is attacking you, the small business owners. And like all of my attorneys, all of my advisors are like, Dude, shut, your, panicking. shut yeah. your mouth, Pedros, right? So now I feel so defeated. June 15th, I'm standing at the buffet in my kitchen, complaining to my wife about like, what the fuck? We've got 27 fit body locations that have shut down already. We haven't gained any new locations yet this, this uh, last couple months. Like, what else can go wrong? And we've got more locations that are threatening to shut down. Like, what else can go wrong? What else can go wrong? Right? And I'm complaining. And I've got like a bagel in one hand and like a cocktail in the other, right? I'm just like carbs and alcohol because that's what feels good to me in that moment. And so I had a moment of weakness, man. And I asked the universe, what else can go wrong? A week later, the project starts. And at hour number 32, a gentleman dies at the project. I asked the universe, what else can go wrong? Because I felt pity for myself. I felt bad for myself. A big, bad entrepreneur is losing his, lost a few franchise locations and is having a hard time coping with losing his identity because my ego was in the way. And I asked the universe, what else can go wrong? And the universe goes, oh, ask and you shall receive. How about a dude dies right at the project? Then for two and a half years, I had a wrongful death lawsuit on me. And that's what can go wrong. And so- Who was that? Uh, his name is Rick Spoon, a wonderful human being. He, uh, he worked on power lines. Um, we raised a shit ton of money for his pregnant wife, for that child's education. Uh, thankfully, our insurance company did the right thing and settled after two and a half years. But if they didn't, I would have had a multiple seven-figure lawsuit on my hands. Um, and I understand, man, like, what, was it like a heart attack or what, what happened? The corner deduced. And by the way, like pandemic, you know what happens? Like if you're going to order a car part, sorry, man, it's delayed the pandemic. Uh, you're going to order a box of papers for your fucking printer. It's delayed the pandemic. Like everything was delayed because of the pandemic. And so now the corner has delayed what was supposed to be like 30 days to get a corners report, bro. It took nine months to figure out what happened to this man. So for nine months, his wife, his family, and rightfully so, I get it. They lost Angry, their son. waiting. Yeah. Just attacking me via you, social media. What are you doing at the project to hurt these? Yeah. Right? And yeah. here I think I'm, I'm like trying to help men. I'm trying to save men. I'm trying to do good. I've got nine letters in my drawer up to that point. By class five, I had nine letters in my office drawer of men who graduated the four previous project classes who sent me letters saying, had it not been for the project, I was going to kill myself. Now I feel like maybe none of that was worth it. Maybe I shouldn't have done the project. Maybe I should cancel class six. And my wife's like, hey, motherfucker, come to your senses. We don't know what the coroner's report is going to say. We know you have nine letters of men whose lives have been spared because of the project. Not because of me, not because of the other instructors. The project is an entity of its own. We are, all we do is administer the project. And I say that at every class. 
The instructors administer the project. The project came from above, bro. I'm telling you, we just, we are the conduit that just administers the project. And in a, in a weird shit show of a way, because we don't get no sleep. They don't get no sleep. It's a weird experience. And um, what did the coroner's report say? Coroner's report said that his heart was enlarged by 26%. And he was probably born that way. Had he done a marathon, an Ironman, any kind of strenuous activity, because unless you get a EKG, right? A, 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 like an EKG of your heart, they're not going to know that, that your heart is enlarged. So any one of us could be walking around with an enlarged heart and not know it unless we do something really tough and boof, there it goes. And there he went right there in, at my compound. What, what did you do when that happened? Did just Good question. So we, we, we prepare for that, right? Because it's not lost on us that someone's going to either have a stroke, maybe a heart attack. Someone might have a seizure. And so, you know, we've got a SEAL, a Marine, a, a competent entrepreneur. We've got a jujitsu fighter. We've got a SWAT guy. So, okay, we're all first aid CPR certified. We got the AED machine with us. We have, we all carry the, the backpack with the first aid, right? We're never more than like 10 feet away from these guys at any given time. Um, and I pictured in my mind's eye, again, being an optimist. This is what we are as entrepreneurs. Someone's going to get injured. Maybe a heart attack is going to happen. And when it does... We're going to put the paddles on them and it's going to shock them back to life. And the ambulance is going to take them away. And after the 75 hours, we're all going to, because we put on suits and go have a steak dinner. And we're all going to, after the steak dinner, we're going to go visit the guy in the hospital. That's what I imagined in my mind's eye, Cody. We're going to go visit the guy and go, bro, close call, huh? You almost died at the project. Well, Rick Spoon did not follow the process that was in my head. He just died. He just died. And so I guess I never accounted for that. I never thought of that scenario. I thought of a stroke. I thought of everything, but everyone survived at the end. So I'm an optimist. We did everything we could, man. And, and the, the fire department, we tell the fire department, by the way, uh, two days before, we tell both Chino and Chino Hills Fire Department, uh, the two towns that, so I live in Chino Hills and my compound is in Chino. So the fire department, police department, everyone knows we're doing the project. We put a big banner on my building, the, the, the skull and uh, this, this crest. So like the whole city knows and they drive by and they honk and, and late at night, the cops see us and they whoop, whoop, turn on their lights and the, you know, like a shout out to the project. Like it's a thing, man. Everyone's, everyone's behind it. Newport beach, lifeguards, whoop, whoop, right. When we're, then they're in the ocean. Um, I mean, the fire department was out there in minutes, like fucking six minutes and we're doing compressions and they put the thing in his fucking bone to, to, to get the, whatever it is to, to his heart, to get it to fuck. Nothing's working. He's dead. And I asked the world, what else can go wrong? That's what can go wrong. Yeah, that's what can go wrong. That's what happens, right? So you don't feel sorry for yourself. You don't take pity on yourself. You don't ask the universe what can go wrong because the universe is fair and just and it will always deliver. Fair and just. So here you are at this moment. All this stuff has hit you at once. What do you do? Go back to what we're good at. Compartmentalize. Now I got to compartmentalize the wrongful death lawsuit. I got to compartmentalize the locations that we've lost. I got to focus on trying to gain new locations during a pandemic, which good luck. Who's buying a gym at that time, starting a gym franchise. Like I told you, we had six people that actually did because they were seasoned entrepreneurs and they knew this would pass and be a good opportunity to buy because um, landlords were given a smoking deal for rent, for renting. Like they were getting like 10 months free rent certain places. In the meantime, you try and salvage your business, your franchise, and you try and figure out what the fuck is happening with the world. Um, I, I, you know, you don't sleep at night. I didn't sleep for weeks, for weeks. My wife would wake up and look at me and I'm just like on my iPhone researching of all the reasons people could die. Trying to figure it out because COVID. So sorry, we can't give you the coroner's report nine months from now, until nine months from now. Uh, but you compartmentalize and you prioritize and then you execute. So I just, whatever was the biggest fire is what we would, uh, are you familiar with EOS? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. From the book Traction, Gino Wickman. Yep. So EOS talks about the L10 meeting. All my companies, all seven companies, we run EOS. We have an implementer named Brian Underhill. He's a fucking gangster at, at being an implementer. And, uh, and so we run an L10 meeting every Tuesday for Fit Body Bootcamp. During the pandemic, we were running two L10 meetings a day 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. So we would run an L10 meeting every day, 8 a.m. And then I'd message to Fit Body owners by 12 noon with a smile on my face, delivering a positive message. I would have to just find chicken salad and a pile of chicken shit and go, here's the chicken salad for today, guys. I'm going to message that. By the way, I've been drinking heavily. 
I've been eating way more carbs than I need to at night. I haven't been sleeping well. I can't tell you guys why, because this death had happened, but I haven't been sleeping well. I just blamed it on the pandemic, but also that was keeping me awake. Now this death, right? But we're all in this together. And I was very open and honest with them about everything other than the wrongful death lawsuit because I couldn't talk about it. And um, at 4 p.m., we'd have another, like information was coming so fast to us from different states and laws and Canada, what we can do, what we can't do. And one of my attorneys was like, He's a total patriot, man. Uh, Lane Fisher out of Pennsylvania. He's like, any one of your franchisees that gets fined for being in business, I will handle their case for free. So I was like, all right. We love Lane. Fucking love Lane. Shout dude. out to yeah. Big Lane out in PA. Yeah. yeah. And he, he's like, he looks like Joe Pesci too. He's a little, little, okay. little, uh, little Jewish dude who's just fiery as fuck. And he goes, I'll take care of all your franchisees and all these different states that I'm allowed to, to, to practice in. And so he, but, but information was coming so quick. We're doing two L10 meetings a day for nine months straight. And we walk into these L10 meetings, just everyone's exhausted. All my, the rest of my team is all working from home. It was just nine leaders, right? Myself, my VP, uh, CFO, like all, all the C-level people and me. It's like, okay, what do we do? We just dive right in. What's happening in this state? What about in that country? Boom, execute, go message. All right. And we did it. Um, and then one day at a time, you chip away, you prioritize, you execute, you put out the biggest fires first, go to the next one. And before you know it, slowly this thing unfolded and we saw what's happening in the world. And the world went to some level of normalcy again after 218 lost locations. Yeah. And, and we've and, gained and, them all back since. And you, and you did another project. Yeah. And, and now you're on yeah. project number what? 17. Uh, we're actually, we're about, we're about to do class 17 next month in June. Uh, so yeah, my wife said, you will not stop the project. You will continue to do the project. And she was absolutely right. Uh, I was just in a place of like, did we just fucking kill someone? It's not why I did the project, right? I wanted to help people. Yeah. I mean, you re and, and you are, and you were. It's really unfortunate what happened. Um, that's amazing that you guys raised a bunch of money for the family and just stepped up and did what you can. I, I've seen like your social posts where you guys honor, uh, is it Mike? What was the guy's no, name? No, Rick. Rick, Rick Spoon, um, yeah. Where you guys have done like, you know, yeah. ho honored him and stuff like that. I, um, and you spun the project off into a father-son yeah. kind of concept. What was that called? Uh, the Squire Program. The Squire Program. All right. So this is really designed to help young men kind of step into manhood. Manhood, masculinity. Yep, yep. So uh, there's a great book out there called um, Raising a Modern Day Knight. By Robert, I forget the author's name, but raising a modern day, raising a modern day night, and my wife's uncle gave me that book when my wife was pregnant with Andrew, so 17 years ago. And I read the book, and I was like, "Oh my God, I need to learn these things, let alone teach this young man who's about to come into my life to be a good. I got to be a good father, right? Um, you know, to, to stand up and make eye contact when you hand sh shake hands, and not just shake hands from a seated position. That that when a woman's going up the escalator. As a man, you stand behind her. When she's going down the escalator, you stand in front of her in case she falls. Backwards or forwards. Uh, if you're walking down the sidewalk, the man takes the street side. All these different things. You open the doors, whatever. And so- um, Real chivalry. Real chivalry. It's amazing yeah. how we've lost that. Yeah. I watch young kids all the time. It drives me freaking crazy. If my son doesn't get out of the car and open the door and, or like let let the, you know, his sister in first mm -hmm. and stuff. Oh, I, yeah. we, we correct that real quick. Right. And, and that's our job as men. But look what society has done. We've bubble wrapped kids for far too long. We kept the training wheels on them for far too long. Everything's okay. You could do whatever the fuck you want. Participation, Participation trophies. trophies. Yep. We don't want to hurt your feelings. If you don't want to go to school today, you don't have to. That's okay too. You want to have, a, you want to have an anxiety day and a depression day. That's okay too, right? And so all these fucking things that have bubble wrapped these, these kids emotionally. And, and of course, Boy Scouts are gone and everything's gone. And we now have multiple genders at the age of three, a child can choose their gender. You could be a fucking unicorn or a fucking man or a female or a fucking half horse, half man. What the fuck you want to be? And so we wonder why suicide rates in teens are so high. We wonder why anxiety and depression are so high. And we wonder why the next generation is growing up very soft. But if I were the opposition, Cody, and I wanted to make sure that I could take the last sovereign country and milk it for everything I can and have zero opposition standing up against me, I would want to neuter the young men of that that country. I would want to just completely demoralize them, dismantle them, call them toxic men. There's no such thing as toxic masculinity. You're either toxic because you're a passive aggressive man and you don't know how to, you don't know how to draw a line in the sand and ask for what you want and set expectations and ask for your needs. And instead you just blow up 
at your wife, that's a toxic man. Or you're a masculine man, a chivalrous man, a savage and a servant, a lion and a lamb, as my friend John Lovell says, right? And uh, so as men were going through the project, we teach them this stuff. Like, you know, we take them on these long hikes with logs and shit. And on these hikes during the day, there's like women walking by in Chino Hills. And, you know, as men, these are men, they're under, they're under a lot of stress, they're under a lot of pain, they're carrying logs, they haven't slept for 25 hours at this point. Uh, and they do get some sleep during the project. So it's not like they don't get sleep. They get about nine to 10 hours of total sleep during the 75 hours because we need a little sleep as well. Uh, but the first 20, the first 30 hour block, there's no sleep. So, but you know, woman's walking by seeing a group of men and she's instantly like, whoa, what the fuck is going on? And so we teach a lesson like, hey, fellas, did you see a woman, two women there? Yeah. Did you notice how they were? Yeah. Did any one of you look up, smile, show your teeth in, in kindness and go, hi, ma'am, how are you? No. Well, do you think that as a man, you're the apex predator and they are helpless in that moment? Yeah. Do you think you probably show up that way in every other area of your life? Yep. Okay. So we teach the chivalry in the project as well. So as men would graduate the project, they were like, man, if I was a kid and I learned this stuff, things would have been so much different. Well, you hear that again over and over again. And you realize, oh, well, I had this thing with Andrew that I had this book that I read, Raising a Modern Day Knight. And in the book, the author talks about getting together with men that you trust when your son reaches 13, 14, 15 years old, as he's about to cross that chasm into, into manhood and putting him through a rite of passage. And the example that he gives is maybe you haven't walked through a, a 30 yard obstacle course blindfolded where there's razor wire and rusty nails and broken glass. And you're the dad is way on the other side. You're coaching them to get And you're get coaching him. Yeah. And he has to trust your voice and listen, right? So I created that experience. I flew out nine guys to Boise, Idaho. We took my son through a very horrendous experience <clears throat> for about 10 hours. And at the end of that, we circled up around him and we all poured into him. I said, hey, fellas, if you can give Andrew one piece of advice that you would have wanted when you were 13 years old, what would it be? And these were some of the most like high-speed men from, men from special operations community and entrepreneurs and just dudes that I like that have my back in life that I've known since high school. Uh, just great human beings. Chanta, one of the guys that I was telling you about, um, dear friend of mine, 25 years. And, and so everyone's just crying and pouring into Andrew. And I was like, wow. So that happens. And of course, men are like, hey, I, I, I would have loved to have this. And I realized there's really no experience for a dad to put his son through anymore that says like, you have won a seat at the table, son, and I'm going to help now mold you into a man, a protector, a provider uh, to serve your family and your community and your country. And so we created the Squire program. It's a 12 hour father and son experience, 20 dads, 20 sons. And uh, we have it, we put it out there that if you're a mom and there is no father in that young man's life and there is no uncle or grandpa that can come with him, uh, they just need to reach out to me. And uh, all the men in my all the men from the special operations community who I uh, coach for, well, I don't coach them for free. They donate $10,000 to Shriners and then I coach them and I waive my $100,000 coaching fee and I coach these men that are SEALs and, and Green Berets and Rangers and all this stuff. Um, I tap on them and I go, hey, will you step in for this young man for this 12-hour period? Mm. And so now I've got this built-in mentors uh, where we've taken a whole bunch of young men through who don't have a father and there's no male figure in their life. And now they are kind of attached to that man. And that young man is as good for that seal or that ranger or that green beret as that guy is for that young man. And you know, now as we've been doing it for so many years, there's a couple of them that are 18, 19 years old. Now these young men who are in great relationships with these special operations guys. One of the guys, um, his name is Sean. He's a former green beret. Sean's got a daughter. So he's like, B, you don't understand. I didn't do you a favor. You did me a favor by introducing me to Malachi. Malachi is this African-American young man who's now 19 years old. Now he's come back around and he serves as a junior instructor oh, I love at the that. Squire program. Bro, I'm getting goosebumps talking about this. It's just, I'm so blessed that I get to do this stuff. Um, and I'm so blessed that I've got a great team and community around me that's just always volunteering to help. Well, you're stepping up and, and counteracting the BS that's happening out there right now that is, really is neutering our young men. Um, this is why I don't let my kids on TikTok. Right. I just refuse. Like literally there to especially to Hudson. Um, Brinley gets to use it a little bit because she just communicates with some of her cheer friends and does some things, but like Hudson hasn't never been on TikTok. Um 
best and, to keep and, it that and way. And that's why. I mean, they they're they're freaking smart how they're strategically just stripping away. Yeah. Um, it's right out of the handbook of how, how do you overturn a government? Exactly. You, know, you just it's generational. You got to. It's a long play, but. Why invade it? Why, why, why throw bombs out? Why, why do all that when you can, over a couple of generations, completely make the entire masculine generation so docile that you can walk in and take it? That's it. And Brilliant. people are so fucking stupid that they're yeah. allowing it to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I love everything you're doing, man. So where are you at right now? So now you're back uh, fit, you know, the, the, the world is back. You've scaled back Fit Body yep. Boot Camp. Now you're back up to your healthy amount of locations yep. that you that you you made up all that lost yep. ground. What's the exit? When 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 does Bedros cash out and get that hundred million dollar check someday? <laughs> yeah, where you're yeah, standing yeah. there. By the way, yeah. I want that picture as right? soon as yeah. you do that. Yeah, so I had a good I had a good friend of mine uh, exit um, out of a uh, he he sold LifeLock. Okay, and uh, two point four billion, I believe, Oof. something like that. And uh, I said this on another podcast. I asked him the day it closed. I called him up. He was my neighbor. He lived across the street from me. And I said, yo, Todd, I'm like, now that he was already rich. But He's I the said, guy that would put his social security on yeah, those trucks. Yeah, right? that was yeah. a bad move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, they yeah. stole his identity sure, real quick. Of course. That shit didn't. But not. it was worth a 2.4 bill. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he eventually <laughs> got there. But man, you know, it's like one of those marketing plays where you're like, I got a brilliant idea, guys. We're going to put my social security up on a, a billboard in the middle of New York. Yeah. Eight minutes later, yeah. your whole entire identity yeah, got gone. jacked. And yeah. it's like, well, that shit didn't work. Yeah. Um, but anyway, he exited and I called him up and I said, dude, what are you going to do with now? And you're like, how, first off, my question was, how many times have you checked your bank account? Because I would have been checking that, like, oh, yeah. refresh, yeah, refresh, 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 refresh. All day long. Just, just excited to know that it happened. Um, and I said, what are you going to do? Like, what's the big move? What, what are you, you going to get yourself? Are you going to buy a jet? Or something like that. He goes, you know what, Cody? I've been eyeballing a new set of golf clubs for months now. And I'm like, that's it? He goes, dude, I'm already rich. I already have everything in life. Like this is just another milestone in my life. Like none of this really matters, uh, but I am going to get those golf clubs. And good I'm like, you. Hey, good for you, dude. Um, so I do want that picture. I want to, I want that yeah. phone call yeah. in, in that pic when you do it, but what's the, is there an exit? Yeah. So we're currently uh, talking to two private equity and, and one of them is the ideal opportunity because they also hold other franchise brands in the fitness industry. The last thing I want to do, because when you think about, um, here's a great example, Massage Envy. When the founder of Massage Envy sold to private equity, they sold it to a private equity that really didn't understand the wellness massage space, and they quickly tanked the brand. So imagine you spend 15, 20 years of your life building a brand that some private equity buys and tanks it. There is a... Um, my research says that there's like a 30, 40% chance of private equity just tanking a brand once they buy it if they're not familiar with that industry, that space. So this, one of the two private equities that we're talking to are potential buyers. One's a private equity, one's a potential buyer. It's a holding company of other franchises in the fitness space. Uh, things look very promising and uh, probably in the next uh, 16 to 24 months, we'll have, a, we'll have an exit. Uh, but very much like the dude from LifeLock, I've been so blessed with uh, just the investments that I've made from my other businesses, right? I mean, I've got a coaching business where I charge $100,000 for a year of coaching, and I've never had a shortage of coaching clients in that program. I've got masterminds with hundreds of members in it. Um, I have equity in so many different brands and businesses out there that, that are public brands and businesses that people have no idea that I have equity in those companies from software to apparel like Fuel Hunt. Um, uh, cauliflower crust company. Um, hey, I'm right? in that. Yeah, and you're you're in that I'm one. I'm in right? that with, yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah, right. and 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 so all this to say that um, I've been very blessed, and I've been able to buy a lot of properties where I've got cash flow coming in from properties as well. Um, so I don't have a shortage of money, and so I'll continue to serve. What I will do with that big money that comes in is I'll be a good steward, steward of it and I will continue to deploy my money, put it to work, create generational wealth so I can continue to do the things that I like doing, such as donating to Shriners Children's Hospital. I plan on dying as the number one donator to Shriners Children's Hospital. I'm currently the number seven donator. The number one donator is what Justin Timberlake. What makes that so special? Um, good question. So about 13 years ago, I, I was having a live event called Fitness Business Summit. I ran that event for 10 years. Uh, 13 years ago, I started it. Um, and a, uh, a cop named Jim Saya 
was there from. He's a Miami cop. And at the time he was getting retired from being a cop and was going to go in the fitness industry. So he had come to fitness business summit, right. To learn how to open up a gym and run a gym. And, uh, you know, I, I, I meet him and he tells me like he was a cop at the peak of the cocaine cowboy era mm-hmm. where cocaine was just coming in from Columbia into Miami. And uh, in fact, for three years in a row, he was known as the, uh, as the toughest cop in Miami. Like there's an award that was given like okay. cop Olympics or whatever. Like he's just a jack. <laughs> I've been cop, shot you know? at more than yeah, all the other yeah, cops. Right. Yeah. You're like, oh, here's your award. Just a cool cat. And then he just casually kind of mentions and, you know, it's been really hard being a cop, uh, a, a a, a cop and a single father of a young man who's got spinal deformation. He just casually mentions that, but he goes, I'm happy that I get to retire and start a new career in fitness. What I'm excited about. And I was like, whoa, whoa, tell me about your kid. And now my kid was born with uh, his, his spine was severed in three different areas. Uh, mom quickly left after that. And so I just did the best to raise my son, but had it not been for these hospitals called Shriners Children's Hospitals, my money would never be enough to be able to get him all the surgeries he needed and to put him in all the different wheelchairs. I go, how many wheelchairs did he go through? He goes, well, think about it. When you're a kid, you grow and the wheelchair has to grow with you. So these wheelchairs aren't cheap. The surgeries aren't cheap and Shriners covered it all. I'd never heard of Shriners Children's Hospital up to this point. And when I think of Shriners, I think of those guys in the little cars. With yes, the hats. And, and the hats, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So it's them and and... So I'm not a Shriner and I never will because I don't, I, <laughs> I, can, just, see I, you, I can see you in one of those little bro, hats. Yeah. Little I, I can't conform to any like group. Like, so I'm not a member of any group. And so like, you ought to be a Shriner. You've donated millions of dollars. Thanks. I appreciate it, but I'll just keep donating. Uh, but since Jim Sia told me that story and we fast became friends, uh, I've donated donate millions of dollars every year. In fact, all my speaking fees. So whenever I pay, I get paid 50 grand to speak. It says right there on my application, do not try and negotiate my speaking fee because 100% of it goes to Strainer Children's Hospital. And they deliver medical services to children whose families need them uh, and who can't afford them. doesn't matter if they have a cleft palate, spinal issues, they were burnt from head to toe. Uh, they are not funded by the government, so they, they do not pander to the government. They are, uh, the contribution comes from private investors like me and you. And so for the last 13 years, I've been donating to Shriners and I've made it my life's mission to be the number one donator when I die. And um, so it, it, probably the most selfish I thing I do because it heals the inner child to mm-hmm. be able to help all these children, right? And so- I like how you frame that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is a very selfish thing. Yeah, I do. I'm sure. Well, it's really cool to see, to see you have uh, that much passion for something like that. Um. Okay, so you're going to exit. What are you most excited about? Continue to keep building companies. I love building companies. Um, is that is that how you think about your money? Like when you you mentioned you have properties. Obviously, this this is traditionally an investing podcast. Right. Um, how do you think about your investments and spending money? You know, if you're are you sitting on a bunch of cash? Is it mainly businesses that you're trying to find and invest in? Do you like real estate? Do you like stocks? Do you like crypto? Yeah, uh, I dabble in crypto. I like real estate and the, so I have single family homes is how we started because it felt safe. One home I could manage. Okay. Two homes we can manage three homes. Okay. Now my brother's going to manage. Right. So that made sense. We got to about eight, nine homes and it's okay, let's look at, you know, small apartments. And so now it's, you know, it's gotten to bigger apartments, you know, whatever, 30, 40 units throughout Detroit, uh, especially I've got a business partner out there named Tony Stefan, who was a coaching client turned investor. And we do a great job in buying these, he apartment. goes and finds, he's the, yeah. he's the actual operator and you're yeah. putting some cash behind it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like and so whether we, I put you can't the cash be paying all your, your, all those taxes, you got to be paying a ridiculous amount of taxes unless you can offset it with yeah. the depreciation. We do as much as we can with the depreciation, obviously. And then where businesses are concerned, um, get this. I, so when I charge a hundred thousand dollars for a year of coaching allows me to not only help an entrepreneur scale their business, but if I like their business, and I feel like I can help that business grow by exposing it to my audience. I have a year of getting to know that person for four seasons, right? Four seasons. I get to see if they're married to crazy. I get to see if they're consistent and they take my coaching and apply it. If they're emotional and reckless. And after four seasons, 12 months, um, if I like the product, I like the entrepreneur, and I have the audience to promote the business. I say, hey, instead of paying me another 100000 for a year or two, what if I take equity in the company and then, you know. Help you blow it up. Put this fuel hunt shirt on everywhere I go 
and put it on all my famous friends. And they go, sure. And so that's how I end up taking equity in businesses that I know I can explode. So smart. So smart. It's like an incubator. Yeah. You're getting paid for people to... <laughs> and I'm not that smart. So I use the yeah. Kevin O'Leary model uh, from Shark Tank, Mr. Wonderful, where I'm, I'm always asking for a royalty, but I do it this way. I go, I'll take equity and like, like I'll use Fuel Hunt as an example. I own 20% equity. And I said, if I can double your monthly sales for 30 days straight, then I want 10 grand a month as cash flow to come back to me. And then when the company obviously sells and I get my 20%. And so every company I take equity in, I have a tripwire set where if I produce this for you, I start getting cash flow. So I got just like Brilliant. apartments, I've got cash flow coming in from businesses as well. It's so smart. Yeah. So smart. I just learned that from watching Shark Tank. Well, listen, man, I started this thing off saying you were one of my favorite entrepreneurs. And, 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 and the reason is, is you're, you're obviously great at business. You're great at making money. Thank you. But the impact that you're really making in, in men and young men right now in a time where we need it more than ever is admirable. It's, I definitely want to bring my son uh, and go yeah, through man. that. Like he, he, he just turned 14. Oh my God. It is the perfect age. Um, I'm just envisioning him complaining the whole time because, you know, he, he's, uh, he's like me as a kid. He, he's, he's going to be, uh, he's going to be a phenomenal boss someday, but God, we got to toughen him up. The wind blows and he's like whining about it. I'm like, man, we got to get you over to Bedros. And you got this really rad ranch yes. now in Temecula. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, Dan Fleischman and I, uh, our mutual friend, we bought a 26 acre ranch where we run all of our experiential events from Operation Black Site to the project to the Squire program. Yeah, we didn't even get to Operation Black Site. That, oh yeah, yeah we, we talked a little, bit, a little bit. That's where you're shooting. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, uh, where entrepreneurs come and learn how to shoot and, and, and learn hand-to-hand -hand combat from like pro UFC fighters and Navy SEALs and Green Berets like Tim Kennedy and I mean- Michael and Chandler. Michael Chandler, right? Jeez, like, dude. You got some like, cool people around fun, you. How fun, right? Like what a different kind of coaching and mastermind program that is. Yeah, yeah. I would not want to fuck with you, Bedros. The amount of training, the, the, the amount of training, amount of training you have, let alone the people surrounding <laughs> yeah, you. I like, a lot of good friends. there's just no hope for anybody to ever screw with you. Yeah. Um, how can people follow you on social media? How can we connect with you? And how can we get involved in some of these cool projects? Yeah, man. So the best place to probably connect with me is either on my YouTube channel Bedros Coolian or on Instagram at Bedros Coolian, and from there. I give so much free content away. I always tell people, I'm either charging you nothing or I'm charging you a premium, 100 grand or 50 grand to speak or you know, 18,000 for the black site. Like I don't have any low ticket items, but when you pay me money, you get 10X to 100X back. But my free shit will turn anyone into a multiple six figure, even seven figure entrepreneurs because I put so much value out between YouTube and Instagram. And if I wanted to get involved in Fit Body Bootcamp, do I just go to fitbodybootcamp.com and yeah. find like what the uh, yeah the very bottom yeah the very bottom, yeah, the very bottom. exactly Th thank you for saying that I appreciate you man yeah yeah so if you want to open up a Fit Body Bootcamp franchise location or at least learn about it see if there's a territory available in your area you go to fitbodybootcamp.com somewhere on the bottom of the page it says franchise information you click that you fill out this application and um, you're going to talk to either Trevor or um, or Bryce, or one of our one of our team members, who are just all awesome human beings. No one's trying to pressure anyone into a franchise. Yeah, but I mean, look, it's a good business. It's it's obviously in normal times, mm -hmm. a, a very successful, very business. successful and, for small business. And I see them. I mean, we got it's cool because I drive by and I'm just proud, you know, I, that I know you and I see Fit Body Boot Camp on the on the on the real estate, and I'm just like, oh, that's my dog. He's killing it. And I see him popping up. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Arizona has been really good to us, man. Yeah. It's sure. a great place for that stuff. Yep. Um, well, anyways, thank you for being a guest on the Clever Investor Show. Guys, if you got some value out of this, make sure that number one, you subscribe to the Clever Investor Show. Um, the algorithm tracks our subscriptions. Obviously, uh, uh, if you got value, share this with another entrepreneur or investor that needs to hear this message that maybe is either struggling in something that they're going through or just want some awesome inspiration uh, that Bedros dropped in this episode. And until next time, we're out of here. Take care, comb your hair. Peace.
Hey, thanks for being a subscriber of the Clever Investor Show. As a thank you gift, we wanted to give you something that we know is gonna help you get started as a creative real estate investor. It's our real estate success kit and it's completely free. Just go to www.reisuccesskit.com to customize your kit, but essentially it's a collection of 15 training tools designed to help you get results quickly as a creative real estate investor. From systems to lead generation to finding cash buyers to creative ways to close deals and get paid. Your free REI success kit is just a few clicks away. Once again, the website's www.reisuccesskit.com.